Welcome to worship this second uh, Sunday of Easter. And we just uh, are glad to have you here, whether in person or online. And if you are here for the first time, please stop at our Welcome Center on the way out just to uh, get some materials and find out a little more information about Good Shepherd Presbyterian Church. Let's stand now, if you are able, for our call to worship. Persistent God. Who rolled away the stone from Jesus' tomb. Easter God. Risen God. We sing our joy. Now please join us for hymn number 664 in the purple hymnal. Thank you. Please be seated and welcome to worship at Good Shepherd. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Psalm 118, 24. The make and take event will be happening on Friday morning, April 10th at 10, April 28th at 10 o'clock. And uh, Dorothy McGrew is going to be sharing her a cinnamon roll recipe, and so what a great opportunity to come out and uh, learn how to make those, and the best part is you get to take them home and enjoy them. So what a great opportunity, and there is a sign up at the back of the sanctuary, and the uh, next installment of That the World May Know is this coming Wednesday evening at 6 o'clock. It's a wonderful series. Uh, Ray Vanderlyn provides a lot of historical context for the events of the Bible that really bring to life so much of the Word of God. So I hope that you will be able to join us in that. And on Saturday, April 29th, a big day. We've got the spring clean that's happening, and um, it's certainly wonderful to keep our church looking great, and not just for worship, but for uh, weddings and other events that happen during the course of the year. Uh, we have so many meetings that take place. It's great to keep the building and grounds in fantastic condition. I hope that you'll be able to come out and help with that. And then George Iraqi's 90th birthday will take place that afternoon. And uh, there's more information in your bulletin that you can get some details on that. And I'm looking forward to that, Georgia. Uh, what a neat, neat event that will be. Are there other announcements for the good of the body that anybody would like to share? All right, well, seeing none, let us sing this little light of mine as the children come forward 
for today's children's message. Steph, it's great to see you today. I've got a joke for you. You see these giraffes on this Noah's Ark? How long should a giraffe's legs be? 30 hundred. 30 hundred? How long should a giraffe's legs be, Ezra? 30 hundred thousand. 30 hundred thousand? Yeah. Yeah, you agree? Well, I'd say this. They should be long enough to reach the ground. Oh, yeah. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> All right, better... Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, let's turn that away there. All right. <laughs> you know, if their legs weren't long enough to reach the ground, what would happen to a giraffe? They'd just float in the air. No? <laughs> like Jesus. <laughs> I've got a joke for the adults out there. Um, when does a joke become a dad joke? It's when the punchline is apparent. Get it? I think not. <laughs> well, I've got here a gavel. Now, if you've ever seen a court case or, you know, when they open up the House of Representatives, they will bang the gavel and say, hear ye, hear ye. You ever see that happen? Well, one of my daughters used to think that what they were saying was, hear me, hear me. Which, you know, actually does make sense. I mean, that's what you're really saying is, hear me. Hear me. Hear, yeah, hear me. And, you know, maybe uh, that's a little bit like what we say when we pray to God. We're saying to God, hear me. You want to bang on that too? Yeah, here, give it a try. Okay. There you go. Have at it. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, you might be a judge someday. That was pretty good. You want to give it a try, Steph? All right. Oh, yeah, just watch your fingers, yeah. That's, you know, one time I was watching uh, them open up the uh, session of the House of Representatives, and the person with the gavel had a grandson there who put his fingers in front of the tray and got him whacked. So he learned a valuable lesson that day, yes. Don't put your hands on that when someone's got the gavel in their hands. Now, I've got here a flashlight. Now, it doesn't work. Why do you think it isn't working? Any, any clues here why it may not be working? The battery's not in there. You know, got to put the battery in there. Let's see if it'll work. Well, what do you know? It just needed a battery. Well, I tell you what, I'm going to read you a scripture today. We're going to memorize a whole scripture of the Bible. I think you can do it. First Thessalonians 5.17. Or, or in just a minute, you can. This one says, keep on praying. Can you say that with me? Keep on praying. What did it say? You've memorized a line of the Bible. Good job. <laughs> 1 Thessalonians 5.17. And just before that, it says, always be joyful. Keep on praying, and then verse 18, no matter what happens, always be thankful. Now, prayer, kind of like the battery that goes into this flashlight for us. When we pray, it charges us up. 
Now, what about this plant? What if I stopped watering it? What would happen to it? What would happen if I didn't give that plant any water? It would die. It needs water. Kind of like we need prayer. The plant needs water. And then I'm going to do this little experiment here, and I, I don't want you touching this while I'm doing this, okay? I'm going to light this. Okay, this is a little candle. Now, in order for the fire to burn, it needs something. I'm going to put this over it, and let's see what happens to this light. It's still burning, isn't it? But how long do you think it can burn? Forever? Until the wax is all gone? You think it'll just keep burning until the wax is empty? Hmm. Well, we'll be here a long time if that's the case. Is it still going? You can blow it. Uh-oh, what happened to it? It went out. You know why it went out? It ran out of oxygen that was in here, used it all up. Well, you know, kind of like this battery needs flash, this flashlight needs batteries, like this plant needs water, and like this fire needs oxygen, we need prayer. So we have to have in our lives prayer every day. Hey! It says keep on praying. Hey! Every day. What kind if of things? If you blow it, it'll run out. Well, if you blew it, it would go out too, yeah. Every day you can talk to God. That's what prayer is. Do you talk to God every day? Do you just tell him about your day? Tell him things that are bothering you, things you're happy about, uh, anything worrying you, things you like, uh, pray for friends. Do it again. Every day, pray continually. And this one says, keep on praying. Keep on praying. Well, I'll tell you what. Why don't we pray right now, and then I've got a little... Uh, a little something for you. Okay, ready to pray? Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, I ask you to help that your children to keep on praying. Help us to remember to talk to you every day so that we're connected to you for our whole lives, that we're charged up, that we have the air that we need, that we have the, the water we need, that we have everything we need because we're connected to you. Help us to remember that and keep on praying every single day. Amen. All right, I've got ah, some Rolos for you. Now, there you go. There's some Rolos for you, and you give one to somebody else, and here you go. You can give, give one away, and make sure you ask, ask Grandma if it's okay to eat them, okay, before you eat them.
Psalm 90, verse 12. Teach us to count our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Let us pray. O oh Lord, you know that the span of our lives in the, in the big picture, in the grand scheme of things, is so short, a tiny drop in an ocean of time that you have created. So teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Remind us that we have at time to carry a grudge. It burdens the journey of life and weighs us down, and worse yet, it blocks the path to you, Lord. Let our toil be for great purposes and not petty things. Few, Lord, come to the end of their lives wishing they had spent more time quarreling with others or spent more time at the office or kept a cleaner house or if only I'd waxed the car one more time. Help us, Lord, to keep life in perspective. Help us to rearrange our lives and our loves so that the things of the greatest importance, things of greatest importance in your eyes, Lord, take the lion's share of our time and our energy and our resources, that they be what we put first. And Lord, keep us far from the snare of stinginess. Help us to avoid and not be drawn into childish battles and wrangling. You, Lord, know the ravenous claims on our time and energy that frivolous matters make. Focus us, focus us, Lord, on the things that bring your heart joy. Make us realistic, Lord, in our assessment of what we can do without you and realistic in our assessment of what we can do with you. Let us not sell ourselves short where your help and guidance is concerned. Let us remember, Lord, that faith carries us that our hope lasts beyond this time and place, and that love conquers all. This Easter season, Lord, make us Easter people, whose lives reflect that we follow a risen Lord. And it is in our risen Lord Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. If you'd please stand for our response. Glory be to the Father.
Our scripture for today is found in 2 Samuel 21, verses 1 through 14. And you can follow from your pew Bibles. The pages are in your uh, bulletin. Uh, first, we'll have our prayer of illumination. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this holy week that we've just been through. And thank you so much for the gift of your son and for the gift of the Holy Spirit. And may that spirit work in our hearts today as we read your word and help it to illuminate our path during today and the weeks and days and weeks to come. In your name we pray, amen. During the reign of David, there was a famine for three successive years. So David sought the face of the Lord. And the Lord said, It is on account of Saul and his blood-stained house. It is because he put the Gibeonites to death. The king summoned the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not part of Israel, but were survivors of the Amorites. The Israelites had sworn to spare. But Saul and his zeal for Israel and Judah had tried to alienate them. David asked the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you? How shall I make amends so that you will bless the Lord's inheritance? The Gibeonites answered him, We have no right to demand silver or gold from Saul or his family, nor do we have the right to put anyone in Israel to death. What do you want me to do for you? David asked. They answered the king, As for the man who destroyed us and plotted against us so that we have been decimated and have no place anywhere in Israel, let seven of his male descendants be given to us to be killed and exposed before the Lord at Gibeah of Saul, the Lord's chosen. So the king said, I will give them to you. The king spared Meshibotheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the oath between the Lord and David and Jonathan, son of Saul. But the king took Armoni and Mephibosheth, the two sons of Aiah's daughter, Rizpah, whom she had borne to Saul, together with the five sons of Saul's daughter, daughter Mer Mer Merib, whom, <clears throat> whom she had borne to Adriel, son of Brasilia, the Mephilite. He handed them over to the Gibeonites, who killed and exposed them on a hill before the Lord. All seven of them fell together, and they were put to death during the first days of the harvest, harvest just as the barley harvest was beginning. Rispa, daughter of Ai, took sackcloth and spread it out for herself on a rock. From the beginning of the harvest till the rain poured down from the heavens on the bodies, she did not let the birds of the air touch them by day or the wild animals by night. When David was told that Aya's daughter Rizpah, Saul's concubine, had done, he went and took the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan from the citizens of Jabeth of Gilead. They had taken them secretly when the public square at Bethshan, where the Philistines had hung them after they'd struck Saul down in Gilboa. David brought the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan from there, and the bones of those who had been killed and exposed were gathered up. They buried the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan in the tomb of Saul's father Kish at Zela and Benjamin, and did everything the king commanded. After that, God answered prayer on behalf of the land. May God bless this reading of his holy word. At the last Wednesday evening Bible study, I'd asked the class what their favorite board games were. You know, there are a lot of classics that, that go way back in time, like Backgammon and Scrabble, Monopoly, a little newer compared to the others, I suppose. Well, about the same as Scrabble. And you got chess going back to AD 1200 and checkers, which they think goes back to 3000 B.C., a uh, board of, of the game was found in Ur. You might think of Ur of the Chaldeans, where Abraham was residing. 
Uh, but um, one manufacturer alone has sown 25 million checkerboards since 1922. What is your favorite board game? Anybody have a favorite? No? What, what is it, Mary? Sorry. Sorry, yeah, that is a great one, yeah. What is it, Ezra? What's your favorite game? What is it? Oh, all of it. Well, you know, that is a good answer. I know some of you ladies out there are like sequins, right? I, I see some hands going up. About code names. That is a fun game. I love playing code names. Yahtzee, I know a couple of you have mentioned to me that you're Yahtzee players. Life. When I was a kid, this was my favorite game to play. People still play it? Yeah, okay. And then my family discovered this game, Wavelength, not long ago. It is so much fun. I just love play. It's very easy to play, very simple, and it's a great deal of fun. Now, when it comes to board games, competitive people tend to really like them, don't they? And why do competitive people like board games? Because there's winners and there's losers, right? It's pretty clean cut usually. You know, my daughter, though, Lou, has a good attitude toward board games. She always says the most important thing is that fun one, right? That's, that's a good attitude to have. But in real life, sometimes there are endeavors that we undertake or others undertake, and there are no winners. And you wonder, how does that come about? Why pursue a course of action in which there are no winners and only losers? I read about a husband and a wife who were having a big argument, and, and their voices started getting raised, and so she said, well, I think for the... From now on, we need to just write notes to each other, and that will keep us from raising our voices. And in a huff, he said, okay. So the rest of the day, they exchanged notes when they wanted to say something to one another, and uh, before bed, he left a note at her spot at the kitchen table, because she was always up early for breakfast, and, and it, it said, please wake me up at 6 a.m. I have an important meeting at work early in the morning. Well, that next morning, he woke up, and he knew something was wrong. He was too rested. Ever happened to you? You oversleep, and you know, because I'm way too rested. And so he, he looked at the clock. It was already 8 o'clock. So he texted his wife and said, why didn't you wake me up at 6 a.m.? And she texted back, look at the kitchen table. And there at the kitchen table next to his note was her note that said, wake up, it's 6 a.m., No winners there. <laughs> now, sometimes we just have a bad day and we feel like we're, we're not going to win, right? You ever feel like that? Someone says, good morning, and you're like, yeah, what's so good about it? Or, I love this look on her face. When you're in a bad mood and someone tells you to smile, it's the last thing she's going to do. Now, this guy's having a really bad day, right? You know, and uh, hippos are actually a pretty dangerous animal. I, I looked up how many humans die each year from various animals. The mosquito is actually the most dangerous by far. Humans are not far behind. Uh, and then you get down to your hippopotamus. 500 humans a year killed by hippopotamuses. I tell you, they're dangerous animals. Uh, snakes so uh, <laughs> far exceed that. Look at the shark. It gets a bad name. It's only four people a year. Yeah, the wolf, 10. They also get kind of a bad name. Now, this next guy is really in for a bad time. You think you're having a bad day? Dan, 21, split with his girlfriend a day before her family won $61.7 million. Everyone, including your sister's boyfriend, has got $12 million. And they're all having a big party down here. <laughs> Well, today we heard the story of Rizpah, and her name means hot coal, which is probably a good thing that she had this kind of burning desire or passion inside of her because of what happened to her. Uh, she had a lot more than a bad day. This is one of the darkest sections of Scripture, and I call this sermon the good, 
the bad, and the ugly. Remember that, that Western? The good, the bad, and the ugly? And they would start off and they show the, the ugly. The ugly in this story is Saul. Very ugly. We're not given the details of the atrocities that he committed against the Gibeonites, uh, but it's pretty clear that he decimated them under the zeal of God, nonetheless. He did this. Uh, how many people down through the rungs of history have committed crimes thinking they are doing service for God? Uh, Jesus warned his disciples that was going to happen to them. There are lots of people with this kind of muddled thinking. He said, the time is coming when those who kill you will think they're doing a holy service for God. It's because they have not known the Father or me. Those people don't know their Heavenly Father. They don't know me, and that's why they are doing that. Another Saul, Saul of Tarsus. You might remember he was going around persecuting the church, breathing threats of murder against the church. Had a hand in the murder of Stephen. God had to temporarily strike him blind to get him turned around and get him going in the right direction, in a direction of love. Well, King Saul had no love for the Gibeonites, even though Joshua had sworn an oath that the Israelites would protect the Gibeonites and that they could remain in the land. Joshua did not allow the people of Israel to kill them. But that day he made the Gibeonites, the woodcutters, and the water carriers for the community of Israel and for the altar of the Lord, wherever the Lord would choose to build it. And that is what they do to this day. For hundreds of years, the Gibeonites had lived in peace with the people of Israel on the basis of that vow that Joshua and the Israelites had taken to be kind to the Gibeonites. And Saul comes along and pretending it was under the zeal of God, he decimates them and does great harm to the Gibeonites. He did something ugly. And you fast forward a few years and now David is king. He's at the helm, but the rain refuses to fall. A famine grips the land, and David begins to wonder, could this be the hand of the Lord against our nation? And so he prayed, and he received his answer. His hunch was right. God takes vows seriously. When you make a vow to God, do not delay in fulfilling it. For he has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to make a vow than to make one and not fulfill it. Jesus also warned against making hasty vows. He said simply, let your yes be yes and your no be no. But the people had made a vow before God regarding the Gibeonites, not to harm them, and Saul broke it, dishonoring the name of God. And so along comes David. The bad. David didn't make things better. He made things worse. The Gibeonites asked David for seven descendants of Saul so they can exact vengeance on the house of Saul. A seven represents completeness, so they want complete retribution, complete revenge. And David thinks this will appease God and end the drought, but that's not the way things work. The prophet Ezekiel put it this way, the righteousness of the righteous person will be their own, and the wickedness of the wicked person will be his own. Sons and daughters, grandsons and granddaughters should not pay with their lives for the father's sin. 
Now, King David's actions here go to show that even somebody who generally follows the Lord can at times make misguided decisions and exhibit bad judgment. You know, with King David, there wasn't a lot of middle ground. He seemed to either succeed spectacularly or he crashed and burned spectacularly and sinned big. And I saw a story on an odd fact of history regarding our White House, and, and I remembered one of my daughters, I think it was Shailen, told me about this. And it was involving Andrew Jackson. And he was another man who was kind of known to either succeed spectacularly or uh, fell and miserably doing evil. But um, one of the strange, strangest events in the history of the White House, uh, Sir Colonel Thomas Meacham gave Andrew Jackson a present, a 1,400-pound wheel of cheese, and plopped it down there in the White House. Now, historians debate whether that was meant to be a gift or a curse. Andrew Jackson gave away a lot of cheese over the next two years. He would cut hunks off and send it to friends and family, but after two years, he had hardly made a dent in this gigantic block of cheese, and it was staking up the White House. And so he got an idea. He would invite the public to come in and help themselves to some cheese. And so the day he opened the White House, 10,000 people showed up. It was a madhouse. Everybody showed up with knives and forks and carved up this cheese, and within a few hours, the cheese was gone, except for they said it was a slippery, cheesy mess everywhere. The carpet, the, you know, the, uh, the, the uh, reporters called it an evil-smelling horror. And Andrew Jackson had to end up basically remodeling the White House to get rid of the stench of the cheese. Well, David did something that stunk to high heaven. Sometimes you've got to recognize that even though what has happened is evil, you've got to cut your losses and chart a better course. More innocent blood is what the Gibeonites demanded. Was that really the answer? Was that really the course David should have taken? Did anybody watch this special on Hulu? The Dropout? About Elizabeth Holmes and um, her company Theranos? Well, she was a brilliant young lady. She was at Stanford studying chemical engineering, and she landed some prized research positions. And she even uh, had a patent by her sophomore year of college on a drug delivery system through a patch on the arm. And she had a, a dream to become a billionaire. That was her overriding passion. And so she dropped out of Stanford, used her tuition money to start a company, which would have been great if the company were on the up and up. Only she got in business with a gentleman named Sonny Balwani, and they claimed that they had developed a breakthrough technology in nanotechnology, a computer chip that you could put one drop of blood in, and 10 minutes later, you could have the results of 200 different blood tests. Only it didn't really quite work. But they faked their way through it, claiming that it did work. And her net worth soared to $5 billion dollars. She was on all kinds of business shows, being touted as a wonder kid. Um, only, it didn't take long before people started figuring out that these tests weren't very accurate. And it was hurting a lot of people. People were making life-changing decisions, medical decisions, based on these tests that were inaccurate. But rather than fess up, she doubled down. And they kept on trying to play this con. And as you can imagine, it didn't end well. Uh, she was found guilty, sentenced to prison. The company went under. All the people lost their jobs. Investors lost billions of dollars. Her actions, piling sin upon sin, harmed a lot of people. It's been called one of the greatest frauds ever perpetrated. Bad decision piled upon bad decision, which is where... King David went. 
King David hands over seven of Saul's descendants, two sons of Rizpah and five sons of Mirab for execution. New sins are heaped upon old sins. One sin cannot cover another sin. Kind of like Dave Ramsey, the financial guru. He always says no one can borrow their way out of debt. You can't sin your way out of sin. Sins can't be slept, swept under the rug. God knows each and every one. Justice must be served, which is why Jesus came. Sin bears a high price tag, and Jesus offered to pay it for us. We repent, and God gives forgiveness. Matthew Henry wrote that time does not wear out the guilt of sin. In vain do we expect mercy from God unless we do justice upon our sins. And Jesus Christ is that justice. We have to settle our accounts. We have to confess our sin and turn away from them. And God is gracious and compassionate and forgiving. The other option is to let the old sins fester, which is what Israel had done upon Saul's death. And old sins have a way of visiting people at an inopportune time. How many lives have been ruined because an old sin pays a visit to somebody? So confess them and turn to the Lord and make peace and restitution where you can. Which brings us to the little bit of good that we have in this story. Rizpah. There's some harsh lessons that we can learn from this touching story of Rizba's vigil over the bodies of her sons. Rizba bears the message of hope and power and abiding love. It shows the results one person can make in terms of an impression on heaven. She left her mark on the pages of the Word of God because of her vigilance her loyalty, and her love. And when the story of what Rizpah was doing, holding vigil over these seven bodies, refusing to let the birds of prey and the beasts, the jackals and the wolves and everything else get to these bodies, David was moved and came to realize his error. So he went to some pains to retrieve the bones of Saul and his best friend Jonathan, as well as the bodies of these seven who hung and gave them a decent and dignified burial. Jonathan placed them in a family tomb, and the Bible says it was only after that that God answered the prayers on behalf of Israel. Arisba's story reveals that there is a reality that sin affects more than just the person who commits them. Rizpah had done nothing wrong, yet there she was keeping vigil on the rock of Gabeah. Her son's bodies hanging cursed on a tree, decaying without the dignity of a decent burial. She was not allowed to remove the bodies of the dead sons. They were to be left there for humiliation. to make atonement for Saul's sin. But they and her sons and the other five died for the sins of another. The sins of others affect us. An addict's lifestyle is hard on a family. The prostitution trade puts innocent children at risk to be enslaved. A nightmare made possible because people are willing to pay for those services. The Bible says a gossip separates good friends. Every sin is like a stone thrown into a lake and the ripples go out and there are side effects. But despite the effect on her, Rizpah stood guard. And she stands as a testimony to this day to faithful and enduring love. Scholars estimate that she maintained her visual for six months. Imagine the difficulty of that time, warding off these animals by night, keeping the birds away by day. 
But there is a message here brighter than the tragedy and the gloom. Something greater than Saul's crimes kept Rizpah staked out on that rock. The great underlying theme is love and devotion, the kind that God wants to call our attention to by putting this story in his word. Rizpah's vigil reminds us that real love reaches past the boundaries of this life. This kind of love, devoted love, impresses heaven and is rare. Uh, People are fickle. Loyalty is rare. We live in a consumerist society where we're constantly being challenged to change our loyalties to our brands and to everything else. Some people will even abandon family and friends and fellowships and churches. Not only do they not stick it out, they will quit over relatively minor irritations. Rare and special is Rizpah's dedication in the face of great difficulty and danger. What God has to say about love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Rizpah understood that. There are those whose love never wanes. Time does not touch it. Distance does not diminish it. Trials do not trip it up. Our love, if we are to call it love, must be faithful through thick and thin, through the chill of night or the heat of day, the kind of love that led Rizpah to endure the shame of battling jackals and wolves is the kind of love that led Jesus to endure the shame of the cross for our sakes. Rizpah stands for all time as a testimony to faithful love. Let us love our friends and our families with the love and faithfulness and loyalty of Rizpah. Amen. Let us join and sing our closing hymn, 10,000 Reasons.
I charge you to go out into the world with the faith, loyalty, and love of Rizpah, and now receive the good words, the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and indeed every day. Amen.